Everything you need to know about Spectre and Meltdown. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morris and this is ThreatWire for January 17, 2018, your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. FYI, I went to CES last week and I came down with the con flu, so if I sound absolutely horribly congested, that is why, but I still wanted to get this episode out to you all about Spectre and Meltdown, so I hope you enjoy it. FYI, also don't forget to check out our Patreon. It's patreon.com slash threatwire. Our next goal opens up a special Q&A between me and all of our patrons, plus it helps me upgrade the set, so definitely check it out if you want to support the show. And now now on to the news. So let's get right into it for the story and discuss Spectre and Meltdown. Announced on January 3rd, just days before I was heading to CES 2018 over in Vegas, the two vulnerabilities exploit CPUs made by Intel, ARM, and AMD chipsets in one way or another. Meltdown was discovered by three different firms, Technical University of Graz in Austria, German security firm Cerberus Security, and Google Project Zero, and Spectre was discovered by Google Project Zero and Paul Kosher. There are three different variants. Variant 3 is Meltdown, affected every modern Intel chip, and two other variants, collectively known as Spectre, are known to affect chips from Intel, AMD, and ARM, at least the very least. Both Meltdown and Spectre type attacks take advantage of a known process used in CPUs to speed up acts. They use speculative escalation to make educated guesses about what processes will be performed next for any kind of given code. So this speeds up the processing and it does not deter from performance, which is great. Anytime this execution is made, a small change to the processor is made and can be measured by other programs. That is not so great. The information can be leaked to different programs such as malware, for example. Also, not a very good thing. Now with Spectre, this can be sniffed via JavaScript code to steal data. With Meltdown, the data is leaked within the kernel memory. Operating systems use page tables, that's what they're called, to map processes or kernel memory and underlying physical memory. Then memory is split in half, one part for processes and one part for the kernel. The kernel memory is shared for all different processes. Meltdown takes advantage of the shared table of memory for the kernel and it finds leaks in the data, exposing it to third-party programs. So the fix is to split up the shared kernel memory for each of those different processes. Spectre versions affect CPUs from the past decade. So in this case, an attacker could exploit the Spectre vulnerability in a CPU to make it mispredict and execute the attacker's code instead of the predictive code that it's supposed to. Alternatively, an attacker could trick a processor into making the wrong speculative accesses outside its boundaries, steering it away from a normal prediction to the one that the attacker wants it to. To fix the two versions of Spectre, browsers are updating against one of the leaks over boundaries, and operating systems and CPU manufacturers are updating against the mispredicting one. More on the updates in just a little bit. Because of the way both exploits are performed, this means that they also affect Windows, Linux, and Mac OS operating systems, and a slew of devices including mobile phones, laptops, servers, and more. They could allow an attacker to gain access to data on the chip, including encryption keys and passwords, just to name a few examples. The CPU guesses what information a computer needs to continue in action, that's the speculative execution action that it makes, and when this happens, an attacker could see data that is momentarily available outside of the chip. Spectre allows an attacker to begin the speculative execution process. The process can then be detected by a third-party process by measuring how long it takes to perform the task. It could, for example, enable buffer overflow attacks. Now Meltdown, the first of the two exploits, is easier to exploit. It enables a third-party process to read lots of data from that kernel, and Meltdown allows the attacker to view the data through the computer's operating system, hence why you need that upgrade to your OS. These are called side-channel attacks, accessing information while it's used for a legitimate process. It's also easier to fix, but it comes with performance hits. Spectre is worrisome for admins because it also affects virtualization. 
The problem is with the design of the chips, not any specific vendor. Intel, AMD, and ARM all have patches on the way or have already started distributing them. According to Intel and ARM, the exploits have not been used in the wild and they were disclosed by a team of researchers in 2017. Not too surprisingly, given the recent Equifax debacle, Intel CEO Brian Krasnich sold stock in the company soon after Intel was alerted about Meltdown and Spectre. Sales were scheduled October 30th, which is five months after Intel was notified. While his sale did not net any more than it would if he sold stocks now, it would be $39 million to be exact, which I'm sure is chump change for a CEO, they still might bring scrutiny from the Securities and Exchange Commission. So who is impacted exactly? Most of Intel's chips are impacted, ARM Cortex-A processors are impacted, and these are ones found in mobile devices, networking hardware, and auto infotainment displays, etc. AMD is impacted by one of the flaws as well, and billions of devices in total are said to be impacted by all of the flaws altogether. This affects processor companies, operating system companies, and cloud providers as well, such as Amazon. Future chips will be designed differently, and as such, they won't have the flaw. So how do you update your computer to mitigate risk from Meltdown and Spectre? Google is posting security updates for mobile phones as of January 5th. Chrome users should enable site isolation in the browser until January 23rd, when Chrome 64 will be released with protections against the flaw. Site isolation in Chrome makes it harder for a website to access data from accounts on other websites. To set this up, you go into Settings, About Chrome OS, check for updates to update. And for Spectre, turn on the Strict Site Isolation option by pasting the link in the show notes onto your address bar and choosing Enable to turn it on. And that link is directly down in the show notes. Mozilla is updating Firefox 57 to mitigate the risk. IBM is also infected and has a month-long plan to fix data center equipment on power CPUs, which are vulnerable to both Spectre and Meltdown. Updates to Power 7 Plus, Power 8, and Power 9 are out now. IBM will also release a fix for its operating system, the AIX and IBM iOSs on February 12th. And furthermore, NVIDIA does not believe it is affected, but they did put out new drivers anyway for GeForce, Quadro, NVS, Tesla, and Grid GPUs. For Linux, Ubuntu and Debian are patched for Meltdown, so update ASAP if you can. At most, you will see an 8% to 19% hit to performance for high capacity workloads such as for servers. For virtual machines and other processes like this, users will see a 3 to 7% drop in performance. Most other day-to-day -day usage will see minimal impact to performance. Those that do not receive or cannot receive updates, like for some IoT devices, those should be replaced. Unfortunately, Canonical had to re-release their patch, as the original patch sent out on Tuesday last week created a booting problem for users of Ubuntu 16.04 LTS. The new patch version posted on Wednesday fixed this issue. A patch for Spectre will come soon. Red Hat released three updates for Meltdown, specifically for CVEs 2017, 5754, 53, and 15, all of which require local access to exploit. Apple's iOS, macOS, and tvOS 11.2 are secure against Meltdown, with iOS 11.2.2 being pushed as of Monday for Spectre. Microsoft is pushing updates to Windows PCs, and Mac computers are secure as of 10.13.2, which was released on December 2nd. All Apple's iPhones, computers, Apple TVs, and iPads are affected. Apple Watch is not. The big ones, though, as I mentioned, were Intel and Microsoft. So Intel has released updates. Newer chips, which are five years old or less, have patches out now as of January 13th. Older ones up to 10 years old will release in the coming weeks from Intel. Intel Haswell and Broadwell chipsets are receiving reboot error so some customers have been told to hold off on patching for the time being until that can be fixed. Microsoft's updates have been a headache. Microsoft halted patch updates after reports of computers being unable to boot after the update. AMD processors and computers would not reboot after installing the patch specifically. Updates via Windows Update and WSUS would resume as soon as possible according to the Microsoft blog, and these issues also created blue screen of death problems for some users. 
features. The vulnerabilities affect older model AMD CPUs, including Opteron, Athlon, and AMD Turion X2 CPUs. While Meltdown does not affect AMD CPUs, Spectre, in fact, does. AMD Radeon GPUs are not affected by either of these. Microsoft also stated a halt to security updates until third-party antivirus confirms no calls to the kernel memory in Windows. Some AV bypasses the built-in kernel patch protection and is incompatible with the latest patch. Affected antivirus vendors need to add a registry key to the startup sequence confirming compatibility with the update. There's a really great write-up by Kevin Beaumont, which is linked in the show notes, that explains that the antivirus bypasses the KPP by injecting a hypervisor to intercept syscalls and assume memory locations, which is also sometimes used by rootkits. So AV vendors should really not be doing that at all. Kevin created a whole spreadsheet of AV vendors who have updated, and the link is in the show notes. The operating system build should read 16299.125 under System Settings about Windows specifications in Windows 10. A firmware update is also recommended from your PC manufacturer, and since it is patchable, no, you will not get a recall and a replacement chip which is unfortunate. No free chips this time. It is recommended to install firmware updates from the PC hardware manufacturer as well as your operating system. Your PC manufacturer might not have an update available yet though. Older devices may need to be replaced entirely since they won't receive updates. As for the operating system updates, be careful with the patches though, especially if your CPU may have a blue screen of death or a reboot problem, and all of those have been reported. But not just that, malware is also targeting users looking to patch their systems. Malwarebytes warned about smoke loader malware, which is targeting German users via phishing emails from a purported Federal Office of Information Security and offers info on the two exploits plus a zip archive, which actually has the malware. An updated list of advisories, patches, and updates is linked below in the show notes. Lastly, you have probably heard rumors about issues with performance after installing the firmware or operating system updates. The update can slow a computer by as much as 30%, but most users will not see a change of more than 2% decrease in processing speed. Unfortunately, if you do patch, you will see a hit to performance no matter what. Intel quotes a slowdown of 6% or less for its newest chips. Older chips will be impacted more by up to 8% slowdowns. Responsiveness which has to do with launching programs, browsing multi-tab windows, encryption, etc., diminished by 12% for newer models and older ones by as much as 21%, such as the Core i7-6700K, which honestly is not that old. Basically, home users doing regular computing on Skylake, Kaby Lake, and Coffee Lake CPUs have minor impact. Gaming, browsing, productivity, those things won't see a large hit. Networking, disk usage, stuff like that will. This is kind of an obvious drawback since the speculative execution of CPUs is done to speed up processing of known tasks, and blocking or negating this process will obviously slow down that execution. Lastly, Google has created their own fix for Spectre Variant 2, the one that does branch target injection and can affect virtualization and is the toughest of the vulnerabilities to fix. Their patch, which is called Retpoline, has little impact to performance and is stable. Since initial testing in December, the patch has not received any support complaints. Google hopes that Retpoline will be universally deployed by other platforms to rectify the situation with minimal impact. Thank you again to all of the wonderful people who contribute to patreon.com slash threatwire. You are the reason that we can keep on bringing you news every single week. We are on the way to our next goal, which is super exciting. We're so close. This allows me to upgrade some of our equipment for the set, which is well needed. I'm so excited to do that. And we can open up the live video Q&A just for patrons every single month. Any little bit helps us to grow the show. And in return, you get access to a bunch of extras on Patreon. I was posting all sorts of stuff last week, so I hope you check it out, and we may even feature your adorable fur babies in an upcoming episode just like these ones, and I love checking them out, so if you're at that perk level, definitely send me some pictures. Again, I apologize for the terribly scratchy throat and the coughing and the tea on set and all that stuff, but I had to get this video out to you. I realized since I was out at CES last week, you didn't get a video, but I 
did want to get out one about Spectre and Meltdown such a, since it's such a big, big deal. <laughs> so anyway, check out the perk levels on Patreon. Thanks again for helping us keep the show coming completely independent and ad-free. I'm totally under the weather, but I really enjoy doing the show for you, and I think it's so, so important, so I'm going to keep on doing it even if I'm sick. <laughs> if you can't donate, hit the subscribe button or share this episode on your favorite social media page. And with that, I'm Shannon Morse. I'll see you next week on the internet, hopefully, in much better spirits and much more much more energy. <laughs>